Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'd like to welcome you to this, the first session, fall session of the Security and Intelligence Working Group of the Canadian International Council of the National Capital Branch. I'm very pleased to be introducing tonight James Trotje, who's going to be speaking to us on North Korea, the Biden administration, and the international community with the subtitle, a very tantalizing subtitle of moving forward or more of the same. Before we begin on this day of national truth and reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin people, the traditional territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee Confederacy. May we honor the indigenous stewards of this land and grow in right relationship with all indigenous peoples. So to introduce James now, he's a fellow of the Global, Global Affairs Institute. He's a lawyer and a former career uh, Canadian diplomat with extensive diplomatic experience in, Korea, in Asia and elsewhere. He has headed the political and economic programs at the embassies in South Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, and was also accredited to Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and North Korea. He led four diplomatic missions to North Korea in 19 in 2015, 2016, while concurrently heading the, the political and economic affairs at the embassy in Seoul, where he was also a diplomatic liaison to the UN US, US forces in South Korea. Obviously a very busy period in your career, James. James was also four years at the permanent mission of, the, of Canada to the UN in New York. And since leaving the public service, he has continued to write extensively on North Korean issues and is considered one of Canada's foremost experts on North Korea. Regularly invited to speak on various expert panels at international conferences and is consulted by think tanks, uh, governments and embassies and the print media, electronic and print media where he is a regular commentator. James, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to join us tonight. And we are looking forward to what you have to say on what's going on in North Korea. Over to you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Valerie, for organizing this. And thank you for your, your kind words. And, and thank you to members of the CIC Intelligence and Security Group and to other participants for your interest and for your participation. I also want to make my own acknowledgement uh, of the National Day for, for Truth and, and Reconciliation. Uh, as Valerie mentioned, I'm a former career diplomat, and a lawyer, and a media commentator, an analyst in international relations, and a fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Uh, more to the point for, for this evening, um, as she mentioned, from 2013 to 2016, I headed the political economic, i.e. diplomatic uh, program at the Canadian Embassy in Seoul, uh, where I also serve as diplomatic liaison to UN US forces on the Korean Peninsula. And I was also accredited to, to North Korea. Um, as Valerie mentioned, since uh, I also headed uh, the political economic programs at various embassies, including, and was uh, also concurrently the Charge d'Affaires de Myanmar, where I had regular meetings with then opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi, other opposition figures and, and senior military officers and ministers a story in itself and, and for another day, perhaps. Um, when I was in New York at the permanent mission of Canada to the UN, I was the lead for Canada's position on global human rights and also acted as the acting legal advisor during part of the time we were on the Security Council. Given our recent absences from the Security Council, you can uh, imagine how long ago that was back in the day when Canada was actually on the Security Council once a decade. So that's another story, again, for, for another day. I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the freeing last week of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, which had particular resonance for me as the focus of my own four diplomatic missions to North Korea was negotiation for the release of a Canadian prisoner, Pastor Hun Su Lim of Toronto. I had the unique opportunity of being the first and only Canadian lawyer to ever attend a criminal trial in North Korea. And the Swedish ambassador and I were also the first diplomats ever to attend such a trial. Uh, Pastor Lim, uh, was, who was charged with sedition, was found guilty and was sentenced to life at hard labor. 
Our negotiations for his release laid the foundation for his eventual release after 32 months of detention. So this experience has provided me with a certain uh, perspective as I looked at the case of our prisoners in, in China. An added element for me is that Michael Spavor was a contact of mine regarding North Korea, not for anything political. Uh, Michael Spavor's focus was on enhancing people to people and cultural links between North Korea and the outside world. So I'm delighted at his release. I also wanted to add that uh, these trilateral negotiations involving China, uh, Canada, United States, uh, were a triumph of diplomacy. As my distinguished former colleague, former ambassador Jerry Kin Jeremy Kinsman, wrote earlier this week in the Ottawa Citizen and Policy Magazine, quote, this exhaustive meticulous trilateral process worked. It's called diplomacy, unquote. And that's what we need regarding North Korea, less fire and fury and more diplomacy. So today I wanna to speak about the Biden administration's policy towards North Korea, the prospects for the resumption of negotiations and the consequences of failure to make progress. But North Korea as a subject encompasses a lot of territory, too much to deal with in a short presentation. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to respond and address remaining questions in the Q&A portion. First, some preliminary remarks. As you may have seen earlier uh, or in the news, earlier in September, there was a North Korean cruise missile test launch. There were also dueling North Korean and South Korean short range ballistic missile test launches. And then this week, there was another North Korean missile test launch. While the North Korean cruise missile launch is not in violation of UN sanctions, North Korea's ballistic missile launches are in violation. And taken together, these various launches signify a warning to the USA and South Korea, and really the international community. They also indicate an ongoing enhancement of military capability by North Korea, and a foreshadowing of an incipient arms race between North and South Korea. Incidentally, South Korea um, launched their ballistic missile from a submarine, so they're now the seventh military in the world to successfully launch a ballistic missile from a submarine. So none of this is good for regional or global security. Hence the importance of examining the prospects for US North Korean negotiations. So in the following remarks, I intend to deal time permitting with the following. One, just some introductory remarks to provide context. Two, the role, the important role of South Korean President uh, Moon Jae-in. Three, the Biden administration's announced calibrated approach to North Korea. Four, the essential elements of a successful US policy on North Korea. Five, North Korea's mistrust regarding American intentions and possible North Korea provocations. And six, the key determinant to the US strategy success. Time permitting, I'll also touch briefly on the role of, of Canada uh, and the international community. So let's get started. The Biden administration faces a host of international and domestic challenges. North Korean policy has not been a top priority, ranking well below top tier issues such as Iran, China, Russia, and climate change, as well as sudden and unexpected crises like uh, Afghanistan in August and September and the Israel Hamas Gaza Strip. strip dispute earlier this year. Not to mention the Biden administration's domestic agenda and domestic crises. However, even benign neglect only goes so far with North Korea. And it would be a mistake to think that the US could put North Korea policy on a back burner indefinitely. As with the Iran deal, President Biden does not have the luxury of time with North Korea. He needs to seize the moment and break the stalemate that has existed since, 1920, since 2019 uh, with the collapse of the Hanoi summit between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. 
either the Biden administration takes the initiative soon in a proactive way that will allow it to set the agenda or the North Koreans will do it for him by undertaking provocative actions that could include nuclear or long range missile testing or both. These type of provocations would go well beyond the recent cruise missile and short range ballistic launches that I just mentioned. North Korean provocations could cause media alarm and sensationalism. There is nothing like North Korean threats to boost ratings. Provocations could cause the US to respond in some kind of knee jerk reactive manner. The provocations and the reaction could potentially undermine the possibility of progress. Progress being defined as the easing of tensions between North Korea and the US and South Korea, the lowering of the nuclear threat North Korea poses, and the establishment of a more stable relationship between North Korea and the international community. I would like to say something about the important role that South Korean President Moon Jae-in uh, plays. President Moon knows the importance of developing and pursuing an active policy regarding North Korea. Throughout his term in office, the South Korean president has been a key advocate of dialogue with North Korea and has played a major role in encouraging negotiations between the US and North Korea, as well as carrying out his own talks with North Korea. Since President Biden came to office, President Moon has urged the US to engage in meaningful and constructive talks with North Korea and has attempted to influence the Biden administration's policy review on North Korea towards a realistic and constructive direction. However, Moon is also well into the final year of his presidency. He is not eligible for re-election. There is no guarantee that a successor will continue his outreach to North Korea. His conservative opposition regularly criticizes him for being too conciliatory to North Korea. This domestic situation highlights the narrow window of opportunity available to the Biden administration. President Moon met President Biden in Washington on May 21st, 2021, in an attempt to influence US policy towards North Korea and jumpstart dialogue between the two countries. Moon was only the second foreign leader to have traveled to meet with Biden, the first one being the Japanese prime minister. The South Korean leader's Washington visit was the culmination of his efforts to have an impact on US policy and came at an auspicious time. Because just prior to President Moon's visit, the Biden administration announced that it had concluded its North Korean policy review. So this is in May and would be pursuing a calibrated, what it called a calibrated approach, which it described as being somewhere between the Trump administration's direct approach to Kim with the goal of concluding a grand bargain and the Obama administration's strategic patience approach, which aimed to use sanctions and other pressure to force North Korea to negotiate denuclearization. The White House described its position, the Biden position as, quote, a calibrated practical approach that is open to and will explore diplomacy, unquote, with North Korea, with the aim of making, quote, practical progress that increases the security of the US and its allies, unquote. However, as demonstrated by the collapse of the 2019 Hanoi summit, high level talks for talking's sake will not suffice and may even be counterproductive. The US needs to develop a realistic strategy with achievable goals. Here, Moon's advice can be very helpful. So what are the essential elements of a successful US policy on North Korea? In my view, there are three essential elements. First, there needs to be a high degree of attention at the presidential and secretary level. Second, there needs to be a realistic policy with achievable aims. Third, the strategy must set out clear benchmarks for the North Koreans to meet and make it clear that the US will reciprocate with its own positive, proportional, and measurable action. So let's look at these one at a time. The first one being there has to be a high degree of attention at the presidential and secretary level. That's a major challenge for the Biden administration, which is dealing with so many domestic 
and foreign policy issues. Is the Biden bandwidth broad enough to encompass North Korea? The risk is that without this sustained high level attention, North Korea policy will drift until the US is confronted by some North Korean provocation. I think we can see the drift happening right now in real time. Such high level tension does not necessarily mean summits. In fact, Trump's and Kim's summit diplomacy, unsupported by either real diplomatic engagement or realistic policy, was mostly show with little substance and ended in the debacle of Hanoi. Biden will not want to replicate that, although at his press conference with Moon, he did not rule out a meeting with Kim under the right circumstances. What it does mean is visible engagement by the president on North Korea policy and work by high level envoys and diplomats who clearly speak for the president and can engage in substantive negotiations. In this regard, the May 2021 meeting between Biden and Moon in the midst of the American leaders diplomatic efforts in the Israeli Hamas Gaza Strip conflict sent a positive signal of President Biden's interest in North Korea policy. Also positive was the fact that uh, President Biden appointed or named an experienced diplomat well versed in Korean issues, Ambassador Sung Kim, as his special envoy to the region. In June, I, I wrote in a policy paper in North Korea for the Canadian Global Affairs Institute that this was a good start, but the effort needed to be sustained. At this point, I am concerned that since that good start, no visible progress has been made. More importantly, the North Koreans are becoming concerned and impatient. That was one of the major reasons for their recent cruise and ballistic missile launches. So that's the first requirement of a successful US policy, the presidential attention. The second one is that US policy must be realistic with achievable aims. Former US Defense Secretary William Perry once memorably said, quote, the United States must deal with North Korea as it is rather than as it would wish it to be, unquote. Unfortunately, US policy on North Korea with rare exceptions has tended to take the opposite approach. A realistic policy cannot be totally dependent on North Korea's denuclearization. The overwhelming view of North Korea experts, including in the US intelligence community and of both hawks and those who favor engagement is that North Korea will never denuclearize. The overwhelming view is reflected in the September, October, 2021 edition of Foreign Affairs, where an article titled North Korea's nuclear family is subtitled how the Kims got the bomb and why they won't give it up. This was written by Sumi Terry, who is a former CIA analyst who served on both the National Security Council and the National Intelligence Council. One has to understand that the North Korean missile and nuclear programs exist within a dense and sophisticated scientific and institutional ecosystem these programs form the centerpiece of scientific advance and achievement in North Korea and are among the few accomplishments of the regime. That regime is not about to relinquish its crown jewels. Not now, not ever. Please consider the implications of this fundamental truth about North Korea, that it will never relinquish its nuclear weapons when so much of US and international policy has been based on the opposite premise. Having said that, North Korea may be prepared to freeze development and testing of new weapons and even eliminate parts of its existing stockpile in return for the right terms. But any policy which requires complete denuclearization before any progress on every other front is a non-starter and will inevitably lead to enhanced North Korean nuclear and missile capacity. That has been the pattern for years to successive American administrations. However, complicating this issue is the reality that explicit abandonment of complete denuclearization as a policy objective is also a non-starter, as it would be unacceptable to the US Congress, as well as to South Korea, Japan, and those concerned with nuclear proliferation. 
there are real concerns that any formal acceptance of North Korea's nuclear status would prompt South Korea and Japan to pursue their own nuclear weapons programs. This would be very detrimental for regional and global security. Therefore, the needle to thread for the Biden administration is how to lessen the threat posed by North Korea's arsenal, believed to have doubled to 40 to 60 nuclear warheads since 2017, while not acknowledging formally that North Korea is a nuclear state. Ultimately, denuclearization must be maintained as a facade in front of the reality of a nuclear North Korea. The denuclearization will have to remain as an aspirational goal while incremental progress is made on other fronts. One has to remember that North Korea's threat capacity is not limited to its nuclear capability. It has forward deployed a massive army, the world's fourth largest with 1.3 million active personnel with conventional artillery, rocket launchers and missiles located just north of the DMZ within range of Seoul. It has cyber expertise. It has a well-trained and well-equipped special forces and not to mention possession of chemical and biological weapons. These threats need to be addressed. In taking an incremental approach that would encompass North Korea's non-nuclear capacity, the Biden administration could address a range of issues, including peace and security, peace agreement declaration formally ending the Korean War, de-escalation, arms control, weapons reduction, conventional arms negotiations, cyber security, humanitarian assistance, easing of sanctions, and confidence building measures. South Korea and the US's other allies would support such an approach, and it would likely gain the support of China, Russia, and other states as well. A particular challenge for the Biden administration will be how to address the issue of human rights in North Korea without derailing incremental progress in other areas. In the four diplomatic missions I led to North Korea in 2015 and 2016, I had what I would term robust discussions concerning human rights. I found that North Korea was so keen to engage with Canada Officials would sit through our strong critique of the human rights situation in North Korea and respond civilly while all the while denying any human rights abuse. As you might imagine, such diplomatic discussions about human rights had a surreal dimension to them, as we were well aware that outside of what I might term the safe space of diplomatic discussions at the foreign ministry in Pyongyang, such a discussion in North Korea about human rights in North Korea uh, is unthinkable and would lead to imprisonment or worse. So the third essential element for a successful strategy after one, presidential focus, and two, a realistic policy with achievable aims is three, that such a strategy must set out clear benchmarks for the North Koreans to meet and make clear that the US will reciprocate with its own positive, proportional, and measurable actions. Specifically, easing of sanctions in exchange for a nuclear and missile testing freeze and or rollback of nuclear capability should be on the table. The aim is incremental progress. The identification of benchmarks and reciprocal actions needs to be the subject of negotiations between American and North Korean officials. U.S. officials will need to satisfy themselves that North Korean officials are empowered to negotiate and able and willing to convey the substance of the negotiations accurately to Kim Jong-un. There is a persuasive case that one of the principal causes of the Hanoi summit's collapse was that in the talks leading up to the summits, North Korean officials had no authority to make decisions. The second cause of the collapse was that both leaders came into the talks with unrealistic expectations due to being told what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear about the negotiations between their respective officials. Truth to power is essential, though potentially hazardous for North Korean officials. I would like to say a few words about North Korea's mistrust regarding American intentions and possible North Korean provocations in the future. 
the Biden administration's declared aim of having a, quote, calibrated practical approach, unquote, is promising if actually implemented. But the North Koreans suspect that the idea of a change in US policy is more mirage than reality and believe that at best, the Biden administration will seek to maintain the status quo on the Korean peninsula while it turns attention elsewhere. The status quo is not acceptable to North Korea, which will demand the immediate easing of sanctions. While sanctions have had a definite negative impact on North Korea's overall economy and a serious detrimental effect on the health and well being of the already undernourished North Korean population, they have had zero impact on the nuclear and missile programs, which are the raison d'etre of the sanctions in the first place and which have continued to expand. Think of that. Could anything better illustrate? the failure of US North Korea policy. One, North Korea will never relinquish its nuclear arsenal. And two, sanctions have had zero impact on North Korea's continued development of that arsenal. Ironically, closures that North Korea itself imposed at the Chinese border out of fear at the beginning of the COVID pandemic have caused far more economic dislocation than sanctions ever did. In my policy paper in June uh, 2021 for the CGIAI, I said that North Korea's initial pro forma criticism of Biden administration policy should not be taken at face value, that North, Korean, North Korea would likely uh, wait and see what concrete measures the US puts forward and to what extent they are oriented to incremental steps as opposed to complete denuclearization. I also said that in the interim, it is possible North Korea will test US intentions by conducting short or intermediate range missile launches. That's the stage where we are at now with the September North Korean launches. On the plus side, the US has not overreacted to such provocations. More ominous is what may come next. If there is a long delay in the presentation of US proposals, or if those proposals are found to be wanting. North Korea may pursue another nuclear test or an intermediate or long range missile launch. To avoid that happening, the US must act to counter the North Korean impatience, which led to the recent uh, launches by implementing a strategy which includes serious engagement with North Korea. So what is the key determinant to the US strategy's success? In my view, the key determinant will be what the Biden administration emphasizes in its proposals. Will it be denuclearization or will it be reciprocal measures by both sides? When Biden appointed his special envoy for the region, he said he would, the appointment was, quote, to help refocus efforts on pressing Pyongyang to abandon its nuclear weapons program, unquote. On the other hand, President Moon described the same appointment as reflecting, quote, the firm commitment of the US for exploring diplomacy and its readiness for dialogue with North Korea, unquote. As noted above, Biden administration officials have themselves spoken of a quote, calibrated practical approach, unquote, rather than one aimed at achieving a grand bargain. So it is too early to say on which side of the above equation the Biden administration will land. Will it emphasize denuclearization or will it focus on diplomacy dialogue and incremental measures. If the Biden administration focuses on denuclearization or merely maintains its North Korea policy as a holding action, it would do so at its own peril and that of the world. I should add that the underlying premise of all that I have said is that Kim Jong-un and his regime are rational international actors and not hell-bent on their own destruction, which would surely occur if the North Koreans were ever foolish enough to start a nuclear missile exchange with the US. In other words, the North Koreans may be bad, but they're not mad. And that they are rational actors is certainly the view of US military leaders. I was the diplomatic liaison to US UN forces in South Korea and participated as such in the biannual South Korean US military exercises. This view of them as being rational actors is also the view of decision makers 
in both the US and South Korean governments, and of even the most hawkish of North Korean specialists. So, so we should keep this in mind in the future when faced with sensational media reporting about North Korea. So I'm running short of time, so I'm just gonna say a few words about uh, the role that uh, Canada and other concerned countries can play. So Canada and other concerned countries can assist by supporting President Moon and join him in urging the Biden administration to take a constructive and realistic approach to North Korea. The international community also needs to persuade North Korea to meet the US and South Korea halfway and respond in kind to positive proposals. For Canada to play a useful role in this regard would require serious engagement on the North Korea file and more broadly on regional security rather than the half-hearted efforts of past years. The US and South Korea would welcome such engagement. But to play a useful role, Canada needs to have sustained commitment by senior officials, adequate resources for the effort, and its own channels to North Korea. This requires accreditation to North Korea of the Canadian ambassador in Seoul, a practice that Canada suspended in 2010. And it also requires the resumption of diplomatic visits to North Korea when travel there is possible. My missions to North Korea in 2015 and 2016 were the first by a Canadian diplomat in half a decade, and such diplomatic visits petered out soon after Pastor Lim was released. At the same time, the North Korean permanent representative to the UN in North Korea in New York uh, should be accredited to Canada, as was the practice in the past. North Korea would welcome such dual accreditation, and this would provide Canada with information, expertise, and credibility on North Korean issues. So to conclude, for decades, North Korea has cycled through periods of reconciliation, followed by periods of provocation and weapons buildup, leaving it at the end of each cycle with a greater nuclear and missile capacity than the cycle before. President Biden has an opportunity to break this cycle and shift the paradigm but only if he moves from a focus on denuclearization to achievable goals gained through incremental progress. President Moon will assist him in such an endeavor, but he also needs North Korea to meet halfway and undertake real negotiations with a view to taking reciprocal concrete measures to lessen tension. The international community, including Canada, should urge the parties towards meaningful dialogue. Failure to achieve measurable progress would mean that before the end of the Biden presidency, North Korea's nuclear and missile capacity and the risk this poses will be greater than ever. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be pleased to uh, take questions. Thank, thank you, James. So that, uh, that was very interesting and a very um, uh, thoughtful presentation and touched on a, a good number of areas of, of considerable interest. Um, for the participants this evening, I would encourage you to put your questions into the Q&A using the Q&A button. We have about 20 minutes or so, just over 20 minutes in order to, to uh, press James on numbers of issues here. So uh, James, we'll start off with one here is that, uh, thank you for addressing the always fascinating North Korea. Should the dovish new Japanese leader Fukimu Kishida make overtures to North Korea? And if so, what reaction would you expect both in Pyongyang and in Seoul? Well, as uh, a lot of your, a lot of the participants will know, uh, Japan's relationship with both countries on the Korean Peninsula is uh, shaped and influenced by its uh, history on the uh, peninsula. And uh, Japan is one of the only countries, in fact, it's the only of the, of the concerned countries in the area, which have not had uh, a meeting with Kim Jong-un since he started meeting with leaders uh, in uh, 2018. Um, Japan has a particular uh, issues regarding North Korea. One is are the launches of uh, 
of the missiles which have gone over Japanese territory and in Jap over Japanese water. But the other one is the kidnap issue uh, of Japanese citizens who were kidnapped uh, from Japan by North Korean operatives in the 1970s and 1980s. And this is a huge issue for the Japanese uh, population. And it's difficult to see how uh, Japan would uh, really uh, move along on dealing with the North Koreans until they got some resolution of the, um, of the uh, kidnap issue. There was some initial uh, settlement of some of the cases some years ago, but a lot of the cases remain um, unresolved. Uh, the other issue is that um, uh, Japan often felt during the Trump, administra Trump administration that uh, the Americans were not paying attention to its specific security needs, as in uh, the Americans seem more concerned about um, restricting uh, long range uh, missiles from North Korea than short range uh, missiles, which of course are the preoccupation of, uh, of uh, uh, Japan, uh, but also uh, South Korea. Um, the long and the short of it is I don't expect that uh, um, uh, in the near future, uh, Japan and North Korea will really be able to make much progress on their own. And for North Korea, the, um, uh, their main focus and the, and the country they want to deal with is the United States. Um, they also deal with South Korea, but even South Korea is very secondary to, to uh, uh, the United States in their view, and Japan is way beyond that. I would say, though, maybe I, I just sort of add on this, that um, uh, for the Americans, uh, the uh, issue of Japan and Korea has always been something that uh, uh, preoccupied them uh, because, uh, because of this history that I referred to earlier. Um, there is a strained relationship between South Korea and Japan. Um, and um, so as they're, they're the two principal allies for the Americans in the region, uh, this is a uh, issue uh, for the Americans and for the Americans alliance with both of them and for the, for the uh, 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 alliance that they can put up vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. Which is a good point. Is I think it's one that's often overlooked is the relationships going back decades um, to you know, the rather difficult relation between South Korea and, or Korea originally, South Korea now, and Japan. Do you see how that can, uh, the U.S. can help ease some of those tensions? Well, the, the, US is always, the U.S. is always trying to uh, 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 broker some sort of uh, reconciliation, some sort of uh, uh, closure between uh, South Korea and, and Japan, but there are all kinds of unresolved issues uh, that continue to um, uh, irritate uh, the, uh, the, the relationship. And so in, in a sense, they, they do cooperate uh, at various uh, levels, uh, but for the public, especially the public in, in South Korea, um, uh, they have ongoing, uh, serious ongoing issues with uh, with Japan, which which <laughs> which is a story in itself, uh, uh, very complicated. G going back to the history, as you say, the colonial history, and then the aftermath. Very true. Um, so, a question here relating to the um, um, Pyongyang's claims of having made six significant strides in developing a hypersonic missile. Do you think that the claim that the Wasong 8 is a game-changing strategic weapon, do you think that's a credible claim? Well, I think that uh, if it's true what they say, I wouldn't say it's a game-changing, but it just adds to the, uh, it adds to the already existing uh, stockpile of, uh, of weapons, and it's part of the continued enhancement of North Korea's uh, missile uh, capability which as I say, has gone through every administration, they go through this cycle. And at the end of each American administration, the North Koreans emerge with, uh, with more uh, weapons and more capacity and more uh, capability. Um, 
and this is this is another uh, this is another uh, part of that equation, and certainly uh, the the sequence of events that have taken place in in September, the cruise missile launches, the the uh, short range ballistic missile launches, are all uh, uh, troubling for that reason. Following on with what you said uh, a few minutes ago on you know, the, the realistic path that the U.S. should take, um, turning the question around to the other side, what concessions do you think that North Korea would consider agreeing to should the U.S. and like-minded nations want, want to make real progress in the short term? And I would also add in, at the end of this question, uh, in the longer term as well. Well, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, you know, there are, there have always been, uh, and there are indications that uh, North Korea, in exchange for uh, uh, something substantive, such as the easing of, of sanctions, uh, would be, or could be uh, persuaded to um, ease off on their nuclear uh, 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 production, on the further testing, uh, even uh, chip away at their uh, stockpile. Uh, so there, are, and that's why I say that it's important in terms of the Biden administration that they look at uh, something other that complete denuclearization. Because if if that is the offer, if that is what is on offer, complete denuclearization, then um, uh, there there will be a stalemate. So uh, what um, uh, one possibility is that uh, the North the, the Americans propose. Um, uh, a sequence of events that, uh, and that's why I refer to benchmarks, um, mm -hmm. they will propose that um, there's a certain easing of sanctions, for instance, um, uh, perhaps humanitarian assistance in return for something from the North Koreans. And the something from the North Koreans uh, could be um, uh, stepping down of, uh, from their uh, uh, tests, um, uh, stopping their uh, uh, production facilities, um, the enrichment of uranium, plutonium production, uh, and all, and then you are faced with the question of verification, which is always an issue in these uh, in these cases. Which is why you would need to bring in the IAEA and and international inspectors. So, for instance, uh, that itself would be a, a bone of contention and could be one of the one of the um, uh, requirements for the North Koreans that they allow uh, international inspectors to, uh, to come in. I think that the field is rather wide because um, uh, while in my view, and I think in the view of, of uh, specialists on North Korea, they will not relinquish uh, these crown jewels of their, of their nuclear capacity. Um, there is a possibility that they could chip away Around the uh, the edges and stop further uh, or halt further development. Well, I think that that leads um, nicely into one of the next question. Here is that um, um, the middle ground framework that would recognize North Korea's right to self defense, South Korea's right to security, and the need to see a much more economically robust North Korea. Um, it. it do you think that's realistic? It's um, if baby steps would be taken towards that in the uh, years. I mean, the Biden administration has got three more years to go. Yeah, the, the and unfortunately, the the Moon administration only has uh, like a, a seven months to go. Um, yes. uh, and and that, in fact, the incremental uh, steps and the the establishment of economic links between North and South Korea is very much on the President Moon agenda, very much on the South Korean agenda. Um, there were uh, uh, explorations and discussions from the South Korean side about uh, rail links, pipelines, various uh, um, mutually beneficial activities. Uh, but the South Koreans cannot move ahead on this independently. They have to get uh, uh, US concurrence uh, to this. Um, and one of the possibilities that had been mooted about in the past was some sort of carve out uh, of the UN sanctions so that um, uh, within the UN sanctions framework, uh, keeping those UN sanctions for the time being 
but allowing the South Koreans to um, uh, establish their own sort of economic links with the with the North Koreans. Um, however, um, that has never been that that has been something that's been suggested and proposed, but uh, hasn't been um, acted upon uh, acted upon now. Um, ultimately, I would say uh, one of the things about the North Koreans is that uh, one of the I mentioned in my presentation that for them, the nuclear weapons were their crown jewel. It was a crowning achievement. It was one of the only tangible uh, something of success that they could show their population. But, it, but it's more than that. It's an insurance policy. Um, they are uh, convinced that uh, without this insurance policy, um, they would meet uh, uh, the fate, or at least the regime would meet the fate, of other uh, uh, regimes that are run afoul of, of the US. So they're not about to give up their um, uh, insurance policy. However, there are, uh, as you say, there are other ways that uh, the two sides could approach each other, some sort of uh, incrementalism, which would require uh, reciprocal action um, on each side. Which would be the pro presumably at this stage very hard to define, given that it's not just the U.S. and North Korea, but it's others um, in the in the region and elsewhere who have an interest in securing um, some advances in North Korea. And one of the questions here is along those lines: is China, China's relationship with North Korea has that. Um, the question specifically is, um, get, can China give up, is it likely that they're going to give up their protection of North Korea? Or what is the relationship with, with yeah. uh, North Korea now? Well, well, the, the question to the first question is no. Uh, <laughs> no, they will not do that. Uh, uh, the, the relationship is, uh, you know, is, is complex. Uh, um, uh, if you go into the uh, war museum, in uh, Pyongyang, for instance, you'd be hard put to find any reference to the Chinese role in the Korean War uh, when the Chinese role was decisive and Mao Zedong's son died in that war. Mm. But uh, as I say, you'd be hard put to find any references in, in, in the War Museum to it. People, I think, misinterpret the um, uh, or, or mistake the the role, the relationship of, of China to, um, to North Korea. Uh, I, heard, I heard them referred to at some point as a tributary of, of uh, that there were tributary state, but which is not at all the case. Uh, so basically China uh, has a major influence on uh, North Korea, um, but it certainly is not in a position to direct North Korea. And it's certainly not in a command and control position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Korea. However, for uh, China, they're, they're concerned about North Korean nuclear weapons uh, for various reasons, including the fact that uh, they, if their conflict broke out, they would obviously be affected. Uh, apart from the exchange of weapons themselves, there's radiation risks. So, so they have a concern about uh, North Korean nuclear weapons, but their paramount concern is uh, security on the peninsula, is peace and security on the, on the peninsula. And that will always trump uh, their concern about, about the uh, nuclear weapons. The, the fear of China, uh, the last thing they want is some sort of unified state, which would mean American troops up on the Chinese frontier in, mm. in North Korea. So uh, I think China is prepared uh, to go with the status quo, if that's what it is for, for, um, uh, for security. But there are no uh, uh, fans of the North Korean nuclear um, uh, weapons either, but uh, the security of the, and stability, I would say, of the, of the Korean peninsula trumps everything else. So do, do you think China has any influence over the, the nuclear program? Uh, well, over the nuclear program, well, they have an influence on North Korea, but it's a very, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, uh, complex and ill-defined and difficult to decipher 
influence, but as I say, they don't have, they certainly don't have a directing, they, they don't direct North Korea and they don't command and control uh, North Korea. Um, over the nuclear program, uh, the thing about the, the nuclear program in North Korea is that, as I said, it exists in, within this very sophisticated <laughs> ecosystem of scientific research um, done by North Koreans. Now, a lot of those North Koreans were originally um, educated uh, and trained, the scientists in Russia and in, in, in uh, China, but they're North Koreans and they uh, pursue what are deemed to be North Korean interests. Now, the, the program has also gotten over the years um, they've, they've, they've gotten assistance, for instance, uh, quite notoriously from uh, uh, Dr. Khan in Pakistan, um, from the father of the Pakistani nuclear program. Uh, there's also been a connection between Iran and, and North Korea. But um, uh, right now, uh, the program is indigenous. It's a North Korean, it's a North Korean program and it's, it's their pride, if not their, if not their joy. Um, I'd also say that, uh, you know, I've seen when I've been in North Korea, uh, and I've seen the, you know, the, the rocket launches. I mean, there is, there is, North Koreans don't have much to be proud about. Um, uh, you know, they they live in a dismal economic situation, and and they know what the rest of the world. They're aware, at least the 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 the, the so-called middle class knows what the rest of the world uh, thinks of them. And you know, and and so for them, the nuclear program is something uh, special, and it's something to be. To be uh, to be proud of. Having said that, there is a, a real debate in uh, I would say in in North Korea, such as debates exist in North Korea uh, at the leadership level between the extent to which um, uh, resources are poured into the nuclear program as opposed to economic growth. And the reason why that debate can take place is because Kim Jong Un himself introduced the subject at the Party Congress, and it's a it's it's an issue which periodically leads to certain officials being raised and certain officials being lowered, uh, depending on how the debate's going and where they stand on the issue. Yeah, but the, um, you mentioned um, several times you've talked about the sanctions and how the sanctions haven't um, deterred the nuclear program, but have had um, quite devastating effects on the overall North Korean economy. Um, recently, an American expert on um, cryptocurrency and cybersecurity was, uh, he, I, I believe he pleaded guilty to the charges that he helped um, North Korea evade the sanctions through the provision of advice on cybersecurity. Is this a real threat from North Korea now, or is it just an example of one of the other aspects of uh, the, um, you know, the cyber cybersecurity expertise that North Korea has been amassing over the years, but not just cybersecurity, but in uh, um, various other aspects of sanctions evasion? Yeah, I, I think that's what you said is, is right. I mean, uh, it's one of North Korea's, uh, the, the cyber expertise is one of North Korea's asymmetrical weapons against the might of the of the US um, uh, and uh, and it's potentially the cyber expertise is potentially a very effective weapon against uh, South Korea which is an ultra tech state and society and one that is vulnerable to attack from adversaries with with tech expertise mm -hmm. um, but the other use of uh, cyber uh, by North Korea is part of the North Korea's long history of of evading uh, sanctions, and that's really what's allowed North Korea to to withstand the global pressure campaign. Um, so it's developed sophisticated techniques to evade sanctions, uh, including covert smuggling networks and illicit ship to ship transfers of prohibited goods, uh, oil transfers, for instance. And the cyber is uh, is part of that. There was a recent uh, earlier in the year, there was a UN report from the uh, panel of experts on North Korea. And the document uh, talked about, uh, accused the regime uh, in North Korea of conducting, uh, quote, uh, I think it said, operations against financial institutions and virtual currency exchange houses to pay for weapons and keep North Korea's economy afloat. And they mentioned the figure 
of uh, 316 million dollars between kind of uh, 2019 and November of uh, of 2020. And and you mentioned about this uh, action by the Justice Department in the in the U.S. Um, there was also uh, back in February three uh, North Korean hackers were uh, indicted by the Justice Department, um, claiming that they had uh, attempted to steal and extort more than 1.3 billion in cash and cryptocurrency from financial institutions and, uh, and companies. Um, the Justice Department in the States in their indictment said that the programmers that they were uh, indicting were part of a North Korean military intelligence agency with a history of nefarious uh, dabblings and these same uh, hackers had attempted to create and market a fraudulent blockchain platform called Marine Chain Token in 2017 and, and 2018. Um, the, uh, one, one of the Justice Department lawyers called them the, uh, he, he referred to them as, he called the hackers the world's leading bank robbers who use keyboards rather than, rather than guns. Um, so the, the other thing is that uh, uh, it's believed that North Korea has been said to be acquiring uh, mining hardware to engage in the production of new Bitcoins and other crypto tokens. And they're also thought to be behind several ransomware attacks, hacks and thefts of, of cryptocurrencies. Um, so basically uh, they're using this as part of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Valerie, um, it's, it's one of a long sequence of ways in which uh, the North Koreans have uh, sought over the years to get around to get around sanctions and this one is the is the uh, the latest one. one one of the hackers that was charged as i say in in february was this was also been previously charged with the cyber attack on sony pictures uh mm -hmm. using ransomware uh at the time so so they've been active for uh for some time uh there's also um beyond that there's the case of the um a few years ago the Bangladesh National Bank uh, had its uh, 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 security hacked and they lost uh, several hundred million dollars, which was channeled from the F Federal Reserve in New York, which holds Bangladesh's national accounts. And it was transferred from there to a, to a casino in Manila and then disappeared. Some hundred million dollars just vanished. And that's believed to be the work of, of North Korean hackers as well. Interesting. Well, one very last quick question here. Um, do you think it's likely or is it a good idea for, and could Canada support an embassy in Pyongyang, um, support it both physically and from the, more importantly, from the security point of view? Well, from a, a practical point of view, I should, I should say that a lot of countries do have embassies in Pyongyang. Um, uh, you know, more than half a dozen EU countries, for instance, the British are there, the, the um, Germans are there, uh, 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 Sweden, which is not part of the EU, but, but is our protecting power is there. Um, so there are a variety of countries that are there. But for us, for Canada, the more pressing thing is not, not a physical embassy. What we do need, though, is the accreditation of our ambassador in Seoul, so he could make, he or she could make regular visits to uh, to North Korea um, to to see what the situation is on the ground and have firsthand information. And I can tell you that uh, when I started to go to North Korea from South Korea in 2015 and, and 2016, our credibility uh, as an embassy went up dramatically in Seoul because the Americans were interested, our allies were interested, um, uh, the South Koreans were interested in and, and we were part of the game part, you know, at the table. And that's what you need to be at the table. You need fruits and information. So, so that's the pressing thing really to have the Canadian ambassador in Seoul accredited to Pyongyang. James, I think that's a lovely positive note to finish on. And I want to thank you very much for your time this evening and for your very, uh, in-depth um, look at what, what can happen now under, under President Biden and his administration and where things will go in the relationship or non-relationship, depending on how you want to define it, with North Korea and what the next steps will be. So thank you very much for, uh, 
for participating in this session of the Security and Intelligence Study Group. Yes, and thank I, you very much, uh, Valerie, for the for the invitation and to uh, the participants. Thank you as well. And perhaps if we see some some steps being taken, we could regroup with you in uh, in a, a few months or whenever uh, whenever it's appropriate, and and see what happens from there. Yes, my pleasure. For the rest of the group, uh, thank you very much for your participation tonight and for your questions that were submitted. And uh, I look forward to um, more sessions of the study group in the next little while. And we, um, um, we've we got a couple of others that are uh, we we'll hope will run before Christmas, including a session on uh, non-traditional -tradi intelligence um, departments of the Government of Canada, and one on the importance of medical uh, in intelligence. So stand by, there'll be more coming, there's gonna be messages coming in the next little while. And apart from thanking James for his participation, I want to thank Lucas for uh, his technical support of uh, the event this evening. I know that Lucas, this has been your first one, but well done and appreciate the effort. So good night, everybody. And uh, we'll hope to see everybody again soon. Good night. Good night.